I thank you, Lord God, for your anointing, for your goodness. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. Stir every heart. Do not allow any born-again believer in his house. I say this because the Spirit of the living God dwells in each one. Everyone that is streaming here and around the world that has the Spirit of the living God in them. Do not allow us. Do not allow us to live a life that is weak that draws back spirit of God you stir us on the inside you stir everyone I know they have to yield and obey it but I'm asking stir them I'm asking for them to be stirred on the inside every one of us everyone 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 be stirred be stirred on the inside come alive to it come alive to it in the name of Jesus God, I thank you. I thank you for a great and awesome day. I thank you for this great and awesome day. I thank you that you have good things, good things in store. It's a great day for the church. It's a bad day for the world. It's a great day for the redeemed. It's a bad day for the world. It's a great day for the redeemed. I'm not looking at these last days as gloom and doom. I'm looking at it as victory. I'm looking at that we have something that the world don't have and the world's going to come running to us to get it. And they're going to ask how and what must we do to be saved. And we're going to tell them, accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept the Lord Jesus Christ with all of your heart. And not only can you be saved, but your whole household. Father, I thank you that there's going to be something supernatural. I thank you that we could just tell them, repent, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Thank you that we have everything we need to make this happen. In the name of Jesus. Let's all say it together. In the name of Jesus. Say, I have the Spirit of the living God living in me. And by his spirit, I am led. I'm guided. He teaches me. I will not walk in fear. I will not walk in deception. I will not walk in confusion. But I'll walk in love and victory. For the path that I walk is brighter and brighter. Amen. Amen. You believe it? Come on, rejoice. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Glory to God. 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 Amen. Hallelujah. I have to preach on me this morning. I do. Amen. You know, everybody chooses their own fast. I pray you're doing something besides discipline the flesh. I pray that you're praying. You're reading the word. You're building yourself up on your most holy faith. That's what I pray. That's what I pray. That's what I pray. That's what I believe. Amen. And I believe God is dealing with different people about different things. That's what it's about. If someone said, what does January represent to you? It's simple. January is compass setting time. You got to set your compass. You got to reset it. And, uh, you know, in the airplane, there is a compass that sets on the dash or hangs from the, uh, the ceiling part there, the hood, the roof part. And, uh, it's a magnetic compass. So that means it's got the magnetic North in it. And so it's accurate. It's accurate. As long as you're not climbing or descending, as long as you're in level flight, that compass is accurate. But that which is in our airplanes, the directional indicator, which acts in correspondence with that, we have to make sure that it stays in connection with that compass. 
That means that before I fly, every time it's on my checklist, you set the directional indicator with that compass. With that compass. Why? Because if air traffic control tells you that you're, that you're, you're clear to land on runway 23, and you're not looking at that little magnetic compass and you're looking at that directional indicator and you didn't set it, you're going to become as confused as confused can be. And throughout the flight, every now and again on a cross-country flight, I, in level flight, I look at that indicator and I look at that magnetic compass and I'll make an adjustment. Let me tell you, God never changes. That's always a constant. You have to set your directional indicator. You got to keep it set. You got to keep it set. You got to keep it set. It goes it just, by, just by the airplane sitting in the hangar, it gets off. Pressure altitudes, different things. You got to keep it set. And this is a time where we can get our spiritual compass realigned and reset in our life. Amen. Because that's what it's all about, getting it realigned and reset in our life. So God is speaking to different people about different things. You remember how many has heard me say many times, I could say hundreds, but that may not have been true, hundreds. But that is, whatever you practice, you perfect. If you practice your temper, you're going to perfect it. That's what it is. Amen. In my morning prayer, I'm not just praying. God, give me a fresh anointing. Anoint me afresh. You know what God's dealing with my heart about? Boldness. Boldness. If you practice it now in the day that we're in, when it becomes dark and you got to have your voice, you're going to be used to it. Practice this boldness. Not arrogant. Not pride, but boldness. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to de- be demanded with a di- different boldness. I stand at a different area. I stand at a different location. This is, this is, the, this is the desk that I work behind, work, work from. You, you, you work from a different desk. You work from a different operating uh, part, wherever God has you. But whatever you do, you've got to be able to not be ashamed of the gospel. You not be ashamed of the gospel. I believe boldness is going to be a great part. Acts chapter 2, it said when they returned to their own company after being threatened, they returned back to their own company. The first thing they prayed for, and we pray that you give unto us boldness. Boldness, boldness. Boldness is not just always something you do verbally. It's how you stand. The righteous are as bold as a lion. It's your stance. Not always what what's comes out of your mouth. Somebody years ago, they haven't been here for, for years. Um, they, they came to me one day and they were talking to someone and, you know, they were, they were quick to uh, run their mouth. You know what I mean? They're quick to run their mouth. I, I, I've said this for a long time. Some people will never have constipation of the mind because they have too much diarrhea of the mouth. <laughs> They're quick to run their mouth. And... Uh, <laughs> She's a biblical girl. Confess your faults one to another that you may be saved. Amen. So anyway, so the point is, what is the point now? Uh, uh, I lost the point. Uh, Huh? Well, yeah, we got to that done. Uh, Huh? Yeah, somebody here years ago kept saying, uh, uh, which could have used a little bit of constipation of the mind himself. But somebody years ago came to me and said, you know, so-and-so did this, and I gave them a piece of my mind. This is what I told them. And they just told me what they told them. I said, they said, wasn't that bold? I said, no, I wasn't bold. That was ignorance. Sometimes we get boldness and ignorance confused. Amen. You know, there's, you don't have the jurisdiction in everybody's life to just be bold. And to tell them what you think. You don't run a, a 10 ton truck over a 3 ton bridge. It'll collapse. Relational equity is what gives you the ability to speak in someone's life and for them to receive it. 
Not everybody. What I say to you as the ones that God's assigned to this church will be received different than somebody that doesn't know me. It's true. It's true. As like Paul said to the Corinthian church, others can deny me. Others can reject what I'm saying, but you're the very seal, the very proof of my apostleship. You can't deny it. So what you can say to your own, sometimes it doesn't. What I say to Josh and how I will straighten him up, I can't come to you and do that to your son. Come on. There's just certain things. Relation has a lot to do with it. So the day that we're in, boldness becomes a major part. But don't confuse boldness by just, not, just by having out-of-controlled flesh. And just speaking what's ever running out of your mouth. Come on. Does that make sense? It's very important that we understand these things, especially in the day that we're living in. Because things will bother you. And the more you're bothered, the less restraint that we have. Amen. Let me read a few things here. I wanted to make sure I save myself some preaching time, but I wanted to read some things. You did not get this. Make sure you get it. I haven't referred to it yet. And uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing. There's just a few that I want to refer to. Uh, This is the I predict uh, that's out there. There's still some more on the uh, Welcome Center. I looked at them today. I've made 100 copies. Uh, But if we run out of somebody once more, we can always do a, a few more. I'm just going to look at number eight. People will continue to leave church life seeking other things to worship and pay homage to. These gnome-like people, head of of eyes covered, will uh, will be part of the great falling away and turning away, as the Bible predicts. Hell itself could perhaps be their new home. So that's what what he says. People that are living like this and falling away, Hell could be their new home. It's no longer heaven. So don't allow anything to begin to pull you away. These gnome-like people will be part of the great falling away and the turning away, as the Bible predicts. Don't be a part of that falling away. There's going to be a falling away. But yet there's going to be a, there's going to be a time where people will come. There will be a renewal. There will be a revival take place. I just don't want it to be a replacement, people. I want to see an increase in this. Amen? That's only one on that side. Uh, Number 15 says, even in America, I see persecution coming to Christians and evil staring us in the face. But those who refuse to compromise will be empowered by the almighty God. Say, no more compromise. You can't compromise. 16, unless men, or mankind, women, unless men repent for being their own God, coming and going as they choose and calling their own shots, they will be defeated with a slow oozing form of death. Repent now. You get that? You cannot. You, you've been bought with a price. You're not your own. The Holy Spirit is well able to guide us through the maze of life and the minefield of danger. Get close to him and develop a severe relationship with him, the Holy Ghost. Do that. Fear and uncertainty will be defeated this year by those who constantly come to hear the the uncompromised word preached. They will be overcomers and live in victory. Amen. You know, a lot of people's not here today by legit things. One of it is this COVID crud. You know, they've had it. It's going around. I mean, it's contagious. People are getting it. I haven't heard any fatality rate about it. But, but the truth is, it's going around. And most people are being treated by just at home over, you know, a lot of over the, the counter uh, meds and di- different things. But uh, we got to continue to stand against it. We got to continue to stand against it. One, one person said they believe this is the strain that may, since it's so contagious, that may bring us into uh, herd immunity. 
uh, whatever it is. But I tell you what we need. We need herd immunity in the kingdom of God by the anointing of God. That's what we need. That's the uh, immunity that we need. Communism is on the move. Marxist, Marxism is in our churches, and the Antichrist is on his way. America has been kicked down to one knee. We, God's people, must pray. Turn from our wrong ways and seek his face and stand her back up again. Though it looks futile, God will preserve America to preach the gospel to the end time generations. See, even though it's dark, there's still a light. We still have an opportunity. That's why I like this. It's not just all gloom. There's answers. We must look up and ready ourselves for his appearing in the clouds. Get in line with the spiritual requirements for this great eternal event. Amen. Thank God. It's going to be good. Amen. You got your Bible? All right. Uh, turn with me uh, this morning again, uh, if, if you would. Uh, hmm. Let me just go ahead and, and read the text we read last week. I have a couple more, but let me just go ahead and start with that. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2 again. Hallelujah. Say alive. alive. Say I've been made alive. I've, made alive. I've, come, alive. I've come alive. Things that are alive, that are alive. Live. live. That's exactly. Things that are alive don't need to act dead. I had a, uh, a salt tank, salt fish tank, when I had the office back here where the current men's room is now. And uh, I had... It was my first salt tank. I love aquariums. I love that. And I had it all uh, Finding Nemo themed. And when the little kids came up from the nursery and stuff, they looked in the pastor's office. And it was good. I had, I, I didn't want just, you know, reproduce clownfish. I was able to buy a little bit more what they called uh, wild clowns. And uh, I actually bought an anemone where they got down inside of it. And uh, it had like lunar lights in this little tank. It was, it looked, I mean, it was, it's, it's first class. This is, a, this is a, a neat setup. But then I put some snails about this long in the bottom, and they got underneath that rock. You never saw them. But these little shrimp pellets that you, uh, oh, I thought my phone was going off. Uh, I heard myself preaching. <laughs> I was like, and I thought I'd turn that stream off. These little shrimp pellets that you feed them, I mean, these things are nowhere to be seen. These little snails. You drop one in, and I mean, you couldn't count to three, and they're coming up through the sand. They sensed that thing so quick, they came up through the sand, and they just hovered over it. I'm thinking, in the natural, you look like they were gone and dead. But when the right thing came into their environment, they came alive. Amen. They come alive. Even if you're like that snail under the sand. Let me tell you, you're going to have to start sensing the right power of God. And you too will come up out of that sand and come up out of that crud where they lay. That's crud down underneath there, man. You come up and you start feeding on the word of God. Because God created you to live. To live alive. To live alive. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Aren't you glad you're alive? He made you alive who were dead. All of us were dead in trespasses and sin. We all had to be born again. Well, I was born in a Christian home. Well, that's fine. You still had to get born again. I asked somebody, when did you get saved? I don't know when I got saved. I was born in a Christian home. What? Too bad. You got to be born again. You got to be born again. You got to be born again. Verse 2, in which, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also 
we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, we've been talking about his love on Wednesday nights, because of his great love, because of his great love with which he loved us. Now, we didn't come out of our mess because we loved him. We came out of our mess because of his love towards us. He loved us first. Why did you get saved? Because I love God. No, 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 you didn't. You got saved because you didn't want to go to hell. You got tired of the junk. The Spirit of God finally got through to you. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us Alive together with Christ. Say alive together. together. With Christ. Christ. Paul said for me to live is gain. For me to live. Paul said I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I but Christ that lives in me now. I've been crucified. Folks when Jesus hung on that cross we were hung there with him. But we still have to accept him. And raised up together and made to set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Praise God. So he raised us up. Even we were dead in trespass and sin. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you were saved. By grace, not, not because of your own works. And raised us up together and made us set together. So he made us alive in him. So if you are in him, you ought to be alive. You know, I realize there's real medical reasons that people deal with attacks in the mind. You are spirit. That's who you are. The real you is not who you see in the mirror. See, some of you get so upset what you see in the mirror and you forget about who's really on the inside. You got to know who's on the inside. Someone asked me the, the other day, knowing that uh, we were sitting there talking and uh, I, I, I was backwards. Really, I was not an extrovert person. I'm really an introvert by nature. I really am. I, if in a, a room, I would take back in the corner. I was never one. Uh, Angel made me nervous and I started dating her. She made me nervous. Uh, not because she was so good looking and uh, so wonderful. And uh, whew, <laughs> glory to God. <laughs> not only that, but the... <laughs> But we would be in a we would be in a uh, an event, and she go up to somebody and she say, "Hi, I'm Angel. What's your name?" I went, "Oh my gosh, I couldn't. I can't do that. I didn't. I, I couldn't do that. I, I'm not that kind of person. I mean, uh, so people say, well, we would never figure that out.'" Well, I'm just not. She made me nervous. She did that. I I had to force myself. I had to breathe deep and swallow to go up to somebody and do that. That's just not me by nature. Why? Because the stuttering issue I had, uh, other things I looked at in the mirror, I couldn't see anything good. And so to me, when people looked at me, uh, see, folks, when, at one time when I thought when people looked at me, they saw ugly, they saw just poor, they just saw out. Honestly, this is because the mirror deceived me. The mirror deceived me. That's why I preach so much, look into the perfect law of liberty, look into that mirror. And so was Luke Pinnell. He asked me, he says, how, 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 what, what brought a change in you? I said, I don't know. It's just the day that I realized my identity in him that changed it all. Now, I still wasn't real comfortable going up and say, hey, my name is Ken Harbaugh. You have to work on that. You have to work on that. But the, the identity in him, now I understand why. Why wouldn't? Why wouldn't when... Uh, I had that vision, that encounter, when he said, you will teach my people who they are in Christ, because I had to come through that. I had to come through that. And so you got to understand what you look at in the mirror is not really you. Not really you. The real you is spirit. The real you is spirit. That's who God made you. You possess a soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. So I realized the real you was born whole. There was no spiritual birth defects in the born again experience. You didn't have a spiritual birth defect. You may have natural birth defects, but you don't have a spiritual birth defect. 
But the enemy may attack some people in their soul. They deal with depression and, and they're oppressed and, and they go through things as that. And so uh, when they look at themselves, they may see uh, the things that depresses them. It keeps them down. And uh, some of it is medical and, and some of it is just where they've been beat down in life. But the truth is, once you know that in Christ, he's made you alive, it has the ability to affect you spirit, soul, and body. Not just spirit, but he can affect your soul the way, the way you see yourself, the way people see you. One of the biggest things I had to beat was, standing up to preach, that actually I had to convince myself that somebody wanted to hear. Honestly. You know how many times I stood at the door years ago, young, and people saying that was good. I couldn't even believe them. Because of myself, I didn't think it was good. You say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But in self, you don't think it's good. Because you can't get past what you see. And because you can't get past what you see in the mirror, it continues to affect who you are and where God wants to take you. You've got to understand that he, that you were made alive in him. In him. You were made alive in him. So God can take, God proved to take nothing and created everything. So you don't have to have the right, all the education, all this, all this, and all that. You don't have to have that. God can take nothing and make something out of it. Amen. He's good at that. So I tell people, you know, there may be some medical reasons why people are depressed and different things like that. But the truth is, if you fixed a lot on the inside, the spirit, it affect everything else in your life. It affect everything else. It changed the way you look in that mirror. It changed the way you see things and, and uh, the way you perceive things. You look in that mirror. So now, when you understand that I'm not who I used to be, that you'll get it. Go with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I turned around the wrong street. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse... Second Corinthians five seventeen. Is that right? I may have uh I may have been in the first Corinthians. Let me check that out. Uh Yeah, okay, let's read this. For we do not lose heart, even though our outward man perishes. We're talking Second Corinthians five, it's sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen. Uh 2 Corinthians 5, I was right in the address. Therefore, we do not look, th therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man perishes, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen. I'm not in the right place. I said 2 Corinthians. Oh. I'm going to get to that. 416. Sorry. I'm looking at. I see the five on my page. Sorry. Just flow with me. For while we do not look at things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal Temporary, but the things that are seen are eternal. So what you see can mess you up. What you're looking at naturally can mess you up. you got to see something beyond the natural eye. For the things which are seen are, are, are temporal, they're temporary. So what you're looking at today, there is the ability to, you have the ability to change it. You have the ability to change it because of who dwells in you. But God, who's rich in mercy, because he loved us, he made us alive in him. 
So regardless of what our struggle is, you keep looking in that mirror and determine who you are by that mirror. It's going to continue to mess with your future. You know, we're all, we all got different shapes and sizes. We're all different shapes and sizes. We're all different shapes and sizes. He will, I mean, I'm telling you, I, I understand what it is to look at something and you can't figure it out. It's like Abraham, God said, you are going to have a son, you and Sarah, but Sarah is barren and you're becoming an old man. How has this happened? The more he looked at her, the less confident he became. That's it. You keep looking at the wrong thing. You're going to keep living a defeated life. Come on. When she was in her 20s and 30s, she was still barren. But 75, 80, she's still going to have a son. I mean, when he looked at her in the middle of the day, He said, no, no, it's not happening. And I'm sure when he came into the tent, she says, no, (laughs) it's not happening. (laughs) Just preaching. (laughs) It's just the truth. (laughs) Come on. So God says, count the sand. So shall your seed be. Count the stars. See, he kept looking. And what he looked at kept telling him, it doesn't work. It's impossible. It's impossible. You keep looking at the natural. You'll keep seeing that it's impossible. You got to quit looking at the natural. But, you know, the natural comes into play. I mean, if you look at something that's not right, get it fixed. So I'm not saying you ignore it, but what I'm saying is you can't determine who you are on the inside by what you see on the outside. You can't determine what God has for you by looking at the outside. The promise was still there in the heart of God, even though both of them looked unqualified. But God, in his goodness, made them alive. Made them alive. Amen. Amen. Made him alive. Made him alive. Now chapter 5. What verse? Mm-hmm, sounds good to me. <laughs> therefore. Therefore. I'm just going to go right to 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ now. If anyone's in Christ, he is what? Uh Uh-huh. Made new. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now, did all things become new? No. When you look at it natural. When I got saved, the way I looked in that mirror on Monday, the way I looked in that mirror, if I got born again, I looked the same Tuesday. If you're short, you're still short, no matter how much you want to be tall. If you're tall, no matter how much you want to be short. If you're this way, it don't matter how much you want to be this way. Or if you're this way, it doesn't matter. There's Some things just don't change. Not everything changed. But what changed was your nature. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. He had a new nature. Something that was dead came alive. So if God created the greatest miracle, that, that which was dead came alive in you, why do you want to keep looking at things As if things are still dead. Why do you want to keep walking as if things are still dead? Why do you want to keep living, try to live a Christian life as if things are impossible? No, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature, new creation, a new species, something that hasn't existed before in life. You have been made new. Now, the old thing that passed away is a sin nature. That's what's gone, the sin nature. Well, how do we sin if we don't have a sin nature? Your flesh. That's how you sin. Your flesh. You don't have a nature to sin anymore. 
I've had people preach, heard people preach that we have two natures still in the sin nature and the God nature. No. In your spirit, you have one nature. It's the nature of God. It's the attributes of God. The old thing is gone is the sin nature. The sin nature is gone. The old thing has passed away. Behold, all things became new. Something came alive inside of you. Now, what God's trying to do, since something came alive inside of you, why do we want to keep seeing ourselves and looking at ourselves as if we're not really alive? We, we can't just live a life when we have a good, happy thought, a good, happy feeling. We got to realize that we're alive, even when we're facing every battle that, that we've ever, that ever come up against us, that there's something alive on the inside of us to get us through. What I'm looking at is temporal that we read in chapter four. You're supposed to be in chapter five. What we're looking at was temporal. It's subject to change, but if you don't understand the power of life inside of you, you won't be able to change it. You're going to accept it for what it is. Doomed despair. Oh, I've asked myself in prayer, why, do, why don't people really want to chase God? I know they're born again. But I come to the same thing. If they become alive in it, they'll want it. They'll want it. I, to see the expression upon people that have come out of sin, that Jesus Christ has changed, to watch that expression is just phenomenal. I've been reading the Apostle Paul, his conversion. If you read the book of Acts, he tells it to four or five different people. Because every time he gets in trouble, he's getting tried by another one, another governor, another king. And he tells the same thing. And notice his testimony never changed. He says, you got to understand, the, the reason, the thing the Jews wants to kill me for, I was one of them. I'm not trying to, trying to take away from what they believe. I was one of them. I, I was there. He told one of them, he says, you got to understand, I was there. I was on my way to Damascus with letters hauling men and women off to prison. I mean... I was the one standing there watching guard over the coats of those who stoned Stephen. Yeah. I bet you he never got that out of his mind. And Stephen looked up into heaven and saw Jesus stand at the right hand of God and said, Lord, forgive them. Forgive them. Don't hold this to their charge. You know that had to affect him. But if you're just reading through it, you don't get that impact. But he says... It was on that day, on that hot day, on the road to Damascus, I saw a light brighter than the noonday sun. I fell off my horse. I heard a voice. I heard a voice. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Those who are with me saw the light but heard no voice. One part says, but he kept saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest me? And then he tells about what happened and how Ananias, another disciple from Damascus, came in and said, Brother Saul, and laid his hands upon him, and his eyes were open, and he received his sight. There was something about that day that he lost. See, he had a zeal for God without the revelation of Jesus Christ. But the day that he got a revelation of Jesus Christ, he didn't lose his zeal for God. He was just focused into the right area. And once you realize that you're alive, you can continue to allow the zeal of God to consume you. You can allow it to burn deep within you and that you no longer have to walk defeated, beat down, wore out. Gloom and doom, but you can live in victory. But that don't mean everything is going to be rosy and peachy. But you know that through your God you shall do violently, for it is He who has tread down your enemies. I'm not going to live dead in these last days. I'm going to live alive. Amen. I want to live alive. I want to live alive. I don't want to just live, I want to be alive in it. I want to have life in it. Some people that are alive, they still can't do anything. I, I don't want to be spiritually. I don't want to be spiritually alive, but on, but but on life support spiritually. I want to be alive. 
I want to be alive. I want to be, I, I, I want to be fruitful. I want to be functional. I want to be bold in these last days. Amen. I don't want my past to continue to dictate my future. I don't want that. I don't want to continue to look at what I didn't have and failed to receive what God wants me to have. I don't want that. I want to live alive. I want to live alive. Amen. There's something about I'm alive. I'm alive. The life of God that's in me. The life of God's in me. Everything else is temporal, temporary. But now I'm a new creation. I'm a new creature. I'm someone new. I now have the nature of God in me. My DNA is different. Just because that is true all nat- naturally, you've got to renew this to come in line with that. You've got to renew this to come in line with that. You've got to renew your mind to come in line with that. You, you know, the, the body of Christ as a whole back in the day, whatever that means, the day, people would come in and get saved and we expect them to live like we live who's been saved for years. When I met some people saved for years are still confused on how to live. But the reason why we don't just try to get you out of bed to get you here at 930 just so that we can support something called discipleship because I really believe it gives us extra opportunities on how to live and walk with God. There's something about that. There's something about being in an area where you can listen and ask questions and learn. There's something about that at all ages. There's something about that. I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want us to be like I've, in some of the churches I've preached in that if somebody gets saved, that, that uh, now we judge them after others have been saved for years. So they say they use a part of an old language because their mind's not renewed and they take the oxygen out of the room. <gasps> How can they say that they got saved? Yes, they got saved, but they got to have somebody to help them. And no matter what level we are, we still need somebody to help us. We still got to grow from glory to glory. Amen. So a lot of people never stayed in church, never walked with God because no one helped them to walk with God. It was, they did this. They said that. They went there. Yes, it is true. Because even though their spirits born again, made new, they still got to renew their mind. They still got to discipline their flesh. Amen. Amen. And you can be saved for 30 years. And if you don't renew your mind just from your flesh, you'll still act carnal. You can't live that way. But we can't live in shame and condemnation either. We have to understand that God made you alive and caused you to, to be seated with him. Amen. So you take these verses in chapter 4 and 5 and you realize that I'm not going to allow the things I see because they are temporal, temporary. They're but for a moment. But the things that are spiritual are eternal. They're a lifetime. I'm not going to compromise what's a lifetime attribute for a short time event. I want God to be in everything of it. Why? Because the old's passed away. I'm a new creation. I'm a new creature. I'm a new creature. I remember the day that I just finished my senior year of football. That was a long time ago. It wasn't horse and buggy days, but it was a long time ago. (laughs) I finished my senior year of football. And while I was in the middle of that season, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, don't don't play basketball this year. Well, that was hard for me because I loved basketball. Don't play basketball this year. I want you to prepare for what I have for you. And at that time, I didn't know nothing about Rama. Rama wasn't even on the schedule. There was nothing on the schedule. You're talking about the end of the first, you know, football starts right when school starts your, your senior year. 
matter of fact, when I applied for Rama, uh, school, it was so late. It's like, I don't even know if there's even a chance to even get accepted. It was real late in that year. But I practiced hard. When I wasn't working, I practiced hard. And I wasn't a great athlete. I wasn't a great athlete. Honestly, I worked hard to do what I did. Uh, people ask me all the time, who's a better athlete, you or Josh? By far is Josh. It just came natural to him. I had to work hard. I really did. I had to work hard. Uh, but I worked hard at it. And the coach that I had would take me and work with me one-on-one. I would go with him to scout teams and one-on-one. And I became fairly good. And um, I, I, was, I was having, my junior year in high school was very was, was very good. And when I went to him and told him, I said, I'm not playing basketball. He said, why? I said, uh, because God spoke to me to prepare for what he has for me. And I believe that's the ministry. What was that got to do with basketball? I, me- I, remember, the, I remember the thing. And, uh, and then he made me feel like I was wrong. And I remember the thing that came up out of me without thinking. Coach, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I'm not my own. And then he looked at me and said, if I'd have known you were going to do this, I'd have never vested my time in you. That was exact words. I'd have never vested my time in you. But from that point on, I kept that in my heart. I don't belong to myself anymore. Now, I knew that in my spirit. But you know how long it took my mind to catch up with that? Took a long time for my mind to catch up with it. Even though I never wanted to quit, do any, I never wanted to quit, but it took a while to renew my mind to what was in my spirit. And if you stay in the Word of God and you stay in the house of God and you stay under the preaching of God's Word and you stay in His book, your mind will be renewed till it catches up with the reality of your spirit and you will grow and do things that you never dreamed that could happen when you looked in that natural mirror. You will be the one, and you will be the very person and do the very things that God has put in your heart to do. Amen. All right, let's stand together.